the application needs to be much more specific and much more understood than will one harm the other. If you don't have a lot of experience, my advice is to partner with a good VFD specialist that can walk you through these considerations prior to specking out and trying to purchase the equipment that would be associated with one of these conversions. Knowledge is everything and doing your due diligence on the front end and being prepared for what the aspects are going to be, I think is probably your biggest benefit. Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we're going to be talking about how to convert a standard AC induction motor from across the line to a variable frequency drive application. So with us today we have our subject matter expert, Mr. Mike Rathman. Mike, welcome today. Good day. Thanks, Chris. Hope you're doing well, man. Looking forward to going through this topic with you. I'm, I'm sure you're going to bring a lot of value to our listeners. And maybe to get us started, just talk about why would end users even want to change their starting method of a motor. There's a number of reasons why, why somebody would consider this, and it really brings me back to some conversations I've had recently with some customers. And changes in equipment could be one, whereas as the process may be influenced by some variable speed operation, could be one. Sometimes it's as simple as the customers just like looking for energy efficiency. And there are efficiencies associated to putting motors on VFDs as compared to across the line starting. But I I think what's important in this conversation is to to have a basic understanding of the impact of what's going to happen to that traditional AC motor that may not necessarily be designed for BFD operation. Okay. If you think about applications, Mike, are there any applications that are typical in industry that would be like a front runner from a benefit of converting from across the line to a BFD? I've seen a lot of them associated with fan operations, could be involved in a boiler, some of your FD and ID fans. Traditionally, a lot of fan operations going back through time, the air and airflow was managed typically through some type of damper operation, right? There are greater efficiencies that can be gained by managing that airflow and air pressures without a dampener, but using the variable speed capability that a VFD could bring into that operation. Okay. So just by changing that speed on that particular fan application, they could get the required output, for instance, by using a VFD. Exactly. As opposed to more of a mechanical arrangement, such as a dampener's within that airflow. So when, you, when you're thinking about you know the cost factor for converting... Uh, cross the line starter to a variable frequency drive. You have upfront cost, but then you have cost savings because you mentioned earlier about the efficiency and picking up efficiency. So when you think about cost, how would you put a, a fence around all the costs and explain them to our listeners here? So you touched on with your state, with your question there, there is the obvious cost of the components that would be used or replaced. In this case, the VFD potentially some of the interconnecting devices that may be utilized in the process. <clears throat> but there is the component of potential cost savings due to uh, power efficiency that the VFD brings into that. So I, I think when you're looking at this type of opportunity for improvement in your process, it is important. There are pretty standardized application tools that could provide calculations based upon horsepower and torque and those values associated with the application, plugging them into a, a, a VFT type of operation that would give you an understanding of energy and potential cost savings that could be associated with that. The other thing to consider that may not be or have as much differentiation is what is the cost over time? There really are no moving parts in a VFD as compared to an across-the-line starter where you have contacts continually opening and closing. So there could be a trade-off in the long-term cost of ownership due to the limited or or minimized maintenance 
and replacement parts that would be associated with that. Right. Now for typical applications, you know, outside of the VFD itself, is it from a cost standpoint I'm talking about here, what other components would be involved or are there any, can you use the same cabling, the same enclosures, things like that to, to physically make that conversion or are we looking at more associated you know, costs from a hardware standpoint just to get this done? So that's a great question that really leads us into the heart of this conversation. And that's some of the things you need to think about or consider if you're going to make this conversion. And there are aspects of of operating a motor on a VFD that are much more impactful. And it may change or add to the componentry and some of the hardware associated with VFD operation. I think you touched on one idea and that is to mitigate some of the electrical harmonic effects that are induced in VFD operation. It's quite often recommended that special cabling be used between the VFD and the motor. So that could be one aspect. Another aspect of the hardware to be considered for costing could be an input and an output filter associated with that VFD to help also mitigate that type of anomaly associated with harmonics in voltage distortion or current distortion. Another aspect that you may have to consider is one of the biggest things to to manage or handle in making this conversion is there's going to be a lot more heat generally created within the motor once it's placed on VFD operation. And that can vary widely depending on what speed you want to run. So depending on the specifics of the application, you may have to consider adding a blower type cooling motor to a traditional AC induction motor to maintain the cooling levels that be required to meet the insulation and operating requirements of that motor. So just physically, you need potentially would have to move more air just to keep it cool. A traditional AC motor, it generates its own cooling through a fan that is mounted on its shaft. The movement or the rotation of that fan drives the air down across internally through the motor structure or externally to remove the heat component. Now that fans to deliver a exact amount of cooling at a fixed speed for a fixed speed AC induction motor. We take that motor and drive it down to 50% of its normal operating speed. Obviously we can conclude we've reduced the cooling effectiveness of that motor by 50%. That's a key. At that point, that's uh, probably an application that we would truly have to consider adding an additional blower motor to provide or make up for the inadequate cooling. Absolutely. Mike, one thing we see a lot of times when we're converting motors to across-the-line starters, from across-the-line starters to a drive, is we saw this in the motor service division at ECO for years, is the phenomenon of fluting and the, the impact that can have on the bearings. So maybe give our listeners a little walkthrough of what fluting is and and things to potentially look for from those harmonics that could potentially damage their equipment that not everyone typically thinks of when they're just doing this conversion. A lot of times this doesn't sneak up on you until everything's done and maybe you haven't put proper grounding or whatever into the system. So can you just kind of walk that through for our listeners here? Sure. And and to Hopefully to keep it pretty basic, this phenomenon has, has existed for, for ever since VFDs started becoming popular and applied. And that is the effect of the coupling of the high switching currents that are being delivered from the VFD through the motor, which basically builds up a charge of electricity on the rotor while that motor is in operation. And over time, that charge will find a way to discharge. Typically, the way that would happen would be through the bearing to the frame of the motor and then to ground, obviously. And that's the ultimate source for that type of fluting failure that we commonly see in bearings and motors that are being rebuilt. So some of the mitigation tasks that we talked about or touched on associated with the harmonics comes into play really here to a great degree. And Really what it boils down to is we can look at two primary aspects of managing this condition. And one is if we can clean up the voltage that is being generated by the VFD 
to the greatest degree that we can, that will minimize this effect from building up an occurring. The other aspect of that is if we could somehow prevent the discharge of this voltage from the rotor through the motor housing to ground, that would also eliminate the effect of the failure to the bearing. So there's a number of techniques and a lot of variables to this equation that come into play when you're trying to manage or, or diagnose this condition. Some of the, the readily available uh, processes that could be used on this is when we touched upon VFD cabling. Another could be an output filter. There are also other devices such as grounding brushes that could be applied to that motor that basically gives a parallel circuit for that discharge to occur to ground without having to go through a bearing. Other technologies that we've used going back to our shop days could be a insulated bearing and insulated bearing housing, those types of approaches break that circuit and prevent that discharge as well. All of these types of approaches to that condition are relevant. I think what we've seen in our history with a lot of motors is sometimes things work better for one customer and sometimes another approach works better. And the reality of that is the specific insulation and, and the details of some of the variables associated with the installation and electrical circuitry in the plan has a great impact on this, all the way from how good of a ground do you really have? How good is the bonding on your grounding from your motor back to the bus of the VFD? All these factors can come in play. My advice when a customer comes to me with these situations now is so you really source a good motor repair source and have them walk through the different levels of options. And there's all levels in pricing and complexity that could go into this from a rebuild process to being able to be applied to a motor in the field. So Mike, you know, thank you for walking us through the fluting phenomenon. There's so much that we can unpack there. But I'm also thinking about when end users want to do that conversion. And a lot of times when you specify drive, you have these options out there. You have filters, you have reactors, you have braking resistors. And we don't have to unpack each one of those, but maybe a high level overview of, of what different components they should consider before they begin this conversion process, that may help. So real quickly, I think with any VFD application, I like to look at two primary aspects that you touch on there. And one is a line filter or line isolation. And that's commonly done through an isolation transformer. What that does on the line side of that VFD is actually removes that physical connection from the drive and what happens in its circuitry from the rest of the distribution system. That gives us the ability to isolate some of the negative aspects that occur in power within that VFD from the rest of the distribution system. That's one aspect of it. The second touches on some of these factors that we've already discussed is having an output reactor or a filter on the, the spec along with that VFD of the appropriate current rating to accommodate the drive can cure a lot of the ills we've talked about from cleaning up the voltage to minimizing or potentially minimizing bearing fluting condition should absolutely be considered the length of the run for the motor. How far is it going to be from the VFD out to where that motor is? And typically anything over 100 feet, you really need to start looking at some of these options between output filters and specialized VFD cabling to manage some of that. You touched on a braking resistor, and that really would apply to the specific application that we're doing and how do we need to manage the slowdown or the stopping of the motor. Something that has a high inertia type load, such as a flywheel operation, you're probably going to want to consider a braking resistor to help manage that power as the VFD is pushing that power off during that slowdown process. But those are a couple examples. Absolutely. That really helped, Mike. Thank you so much. I mean, and maybe to, tr to kind of wrap us up here, any, any parting advice or wisdom? I know you've been involved with a lot of these conversions with your experience in the past. Anything you would offer up as, hey, don't forget to do this or definitely do not do this or things like that to, to help our listeners here? I would say it's probably the biggest thing is there's no right or wrong. I, I've had customers come to me recently and are looking at, at doing this type of a conversion. 
and has asked me is a particular VFD guaranteed not to damage the motor. And unfortunately, that's not really the, the perspective to approach this. The application needs to be much more specific and much more understood than will one harm the other. If you don't have a lot of experience understanding some of these anomalies and conditions that we've talked about here today, my advice is to partner with a good VFD specialist. And there's plenty of them out there all the way from your OEMs to your distributors that can walk you through these considerations prior to specking out and trying to purchase the equipment that would be associated with one of these conversions. That would be my big thing. It's just knowledge is everything and doing your due, due diligence on the front end and being prepared for what the aspects are going to be, I think is probably your biggest benefit. Absolutely. And then I love the, the way you made the tie to partnership. You find the right partners in industry, no matter where you're at, there are subject matter experts in, in all these different fields that can help you through some of these, because let's face it, some of these topics are complex. They're difficult. Mike, thank you so much. You really helped us here with this topic of doing a conversion from a cross line installer to the drive. Really appreciate the insight that you brought. Hopefully our listeners picked up some things, some pointers here that they'll take in the future on these projects. And it's always a pleasure, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I, I appreciate it and enjoyed it as always. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S. -S 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 -S